setting aside the uh, the emotional issues, looking at it just in terms of public policy and the law. If the state of Texas wins this, it's a, a serious undermining of federal authority across the board. Thanks for tuning in to Keep It Legal, the show where we break down concepts, litigation, and current events with our legal experts. I'm your host, Mark Anik. Joining me today is none other than the founder and CEO of Andrevet Legal Media and Marketing, our company, Mike Andrevet. Mike, thank you for joining us. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me. So I want to go back to 1995 when you started this little endeavor, uh, one man sitting in your house. Did you, uh, 28 years later, to be sitting here doing a podcast, uh, you've got a company with offices in Dallas, Houston, Austin, and San Antonio. I mean, there were no podcasts in 1995, but it's got to be amazing to you to sit here and just think about the fact that we're doing this. There was barely an internet in 1995. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's gratifying. Uh, you know, uh, starting out, uh, the vision that I had was uh, as a reporter, uh, as you were, uh, I, I was assigned to a lot of uh, stories that involved uh, uh, trials, uh, legal issues, legislation. And I found that uh, the lawyers who I covered uh, were just totally unprepared to uh, interact with me as a member of the media. And that had real ramifications, I felt, for their clients. And so, uh, you know, initially, uh, my vision was pretty narrow, and that was to help lawyers and law firms that were involved in, you know, so-called high-profile cases. And I did that. What I probably didn't anticipate was that once you started to do that work and you gained the confidence of your clients, uh, lawyers, and uh, managing partners at law firms, they would begin to ask you to help them in other areas of communication, such as advertising and, you know, uh, websites and in this day and age, social media and understanding, you know, the intensity of public opinion. And so it's been uh, really gratifying. But to answer your original question, I could never have anticipated that it would have taken on the scope and breadth that it has. And uh, each year now we put together our own list of top legal stories, the Androvet Legal Media uh, list of top 10. We pull it together here at the office. Uh, over the last several years, we've been very fortunate. Our partners at the Texas Law Book have published the list there as well. And we invited you to uh, come join us today so that the two of us can uh, share what little wisdom we have, uh, but talk about the different items on the list and uh, perhaps you know, pass along a few thoughts on those. So we should get to it because we have, by definition, 10 items. Um, so let's start with number 10. Uh, and, and it's funny, I was looking over this list, Mike, and it, it's always a reminder to me how long the year is because the number 10 item is that story that was sad, if you're a fan of the zoo, uh, but also a little quirky and one that made national headlines with all of the animals that began to disappear from the Dallas Zoo. It was odd. At first, it seemed like an isolated incident. And then uh, over the course of that month in January, there were uh, more animals disappearing, more what appeared to be vandalism at the zoo. And, uh, you know, there was a moment where I think as a community, uh, we all looked at it and said, hey, this is serious. Yeah, like what is going on over at the zoo? I'm looking at Alyssa, our producer, has created a list. We had Nova the clouded leopard uh, that was cut from uh, her mesh enclosure. Uh, we had an endangered vulture that was found dead. And two tamarind monkeys uh, go missing all in the month of January, so exactly a year ago. Uh, we sat down and we chatted with uh, Carrington, Coleman, Sloman, and Blumenthal's Chad Ray, and he passed along a few thoughts that he had on those happenings at the zoo. Dallas Zoo's security uh, actually comes out looking pretty good after this event. Their ability to collect information from their employees, uh, in including that was seemingly unrelated, uh, allowed them to 
pretty quickly uh, focus in on a suspect. They were able to get images of that suspect from their security system and send those out into the community. Uh, and that led to information uh, coming in from other institutions, in, including the uh, aquarium, where the same individual was asking suspicious questions. And that allowed uh, some coordination between different institutions uh, that this individual was uh, looking at. While it's, again, true that he was able to get animals off the premises, the fact that they got the animals back relatively quickly, safely, and were able to uh, find the individual responsible uh, quickly, uh, I, I actually think bodes well for, for how the Dallas Zoo uh, is currently managing its security. The individual who was uh, arrested for uh, stealing the monkeys uh, was was found to have mental health issues that contributed to this and that he was sent for mental health treatment. Uh, I think that that actually uh, speaks well to the authorities trying to address this in an, in an appropriate way, and I think they should be commended for that. The judicial system at large uh, should be commended for that. Trying to take, for example, a clouded leopard home and keep it as a pet um, you know, it, it may be friend shape, but it is not a friend. So Chad uh, uh, gives props, and I think appropriately so, to the system uh, with regard to the mental health aspect of this and the fact that, yes, they, they caught the individual, they processed him through the system, but he did not end up sitting in a cell convicted of a crime, which was probably the right way to approach this. I think... Uh Everything about this uh, investigation and, and the result was textbook. The zoo uh, did an outstanding job in uh, uh, reacting to an unfortunate set of circumstances, heightening their security. Uh, the police uh, handled this professionally and diligently. And, you know, one thread that I think will run through our top 10 is that sometimes these localized events have uh, wider uh, ramifications. And, you know, in the zoo community, what happens in Dallas is studied and learned uh, at other uh, zoo communities. And what happened at, at Dallas Zoo, uh, while, you know, somewhat unique, is not completely rare. And so I think that this, uh, what has happened here, uh, will serve zoos around the country, perhaps the world, in terms of how to address a situation such as this. Yeah, and Chad makes the point that the zoo, there were lots of questions in the moment. I remember everybody was, what is going on? Who is in charge over there? But Chad makes the point that in the end, the zoo actually came out doing all right in all of this. Yeah, and I think, I think that's right. Yeah. All right, number nine. Our number nine story was the indictment of Patrick Clark uh, for the murder of Migos rapper Takeoff, Patrick Clark's attorney, Letitia Quinones Hollins, also a friend of this podcast, discusses what she calls a rush to judgment. Texas is known for stand your ground. Texas is known for believing that you have a right to defend yourself against the use of deadly force, no matter where it comes from and no matter who it comes from. That's what we stand for, is that we have a right to safe liberty as we live within this jurisdiction. When we think about the charges, they are a rush to judgment and they are an answer to the call that someone must be held responsible as opposed to the right person being held responsible. When I think about the national attention that this case has received, it's actually sad to me. Because at the end of the day, you have two young African-American males whose lives were adversely affected. Of course, you have Takeoff, who in fact has lost his life as a result of the incidents that occurred on that night. And then you have Patrick Clark, who is an innocent man who is charged with the first degree felony of murder. Specifically, I would like for people to stand down when it comes to judgment, to allow the judicial process to run its course to allow the evidence to be presented in a fashion for which the Constitution allows. And that to remember that we must always follow the law, and that is, is whenever someone is using deadly force against you, 
you have a right to use deadly force against them. And let's not lose sight of that, regardless of who the players are. Mike, you and I have spent the better part of 20 plus years talking to lawyers in Letitia's position where they have a high profile case. Do they speak? Do they not speak? And very often, and it varies as we both know, and as the lawyers know better than we, it varies depending on the case. It varies depending on the circumstances. But more than once, we have advocated for a lawyer to do what she is doing, to get out there and start advocating in the court of public opinion before she gets into a courtroom where she can advocate in front of a jury. As you listen to her speak about Patrick Clark and about takeoff uh, and the comments that she, she makes here, what, what thoughts go through your mind? Well, let me start with where, uh, uh, where many lawyers come from, and that is the reason not to speak. Uh, number one, uh, lawyers are concerned about ethical rules that prohibit uh, public speech if they're designed to uh, unreasonably uh, influence a jury. And then as a more practical matter, uh, lawyers don't like to make statements that are disproved in court. And, you know, you always have to worry about how the judge in your particular case uh, is going to feel about your public comments. So those are all the reasons why not to speak. And I would just uh, put forward this thought that those rationales uh, made more sense uh, before social media, before the widespread participation that our societies uh, have in uh, matters of public importance. If you're the criminal defendant, uh, you know, your uh, reputation and character is not only the subject maybe of an occasional news story, but now you're fair game uh, in all kinds of platforms in front of all kinds of viewers, including perhaps employers and educators. And, and so uh, I, uh, I think uh, what Letitia has done there is part of your zealous advocacy. You know, uh, uh, the underlying facts in this case are still extremely confusing. Uh, you know, there was a shooting. There are some 30 witnesses. Apparently, uh, most, if not all, are not cooperating. The uh, arrest is based on a reconstruction of video. And so without comment as to, uh, you know, guilt or innocence or culpability, you know, at least, at least right now, uh, there is a a burden upon the state to prove. And uh, Mr. Clark is uh, presumed innocent until proved guilty. And so I think uh, Letitia is, is uh, fulfilling her obligations there to at least say to the public, uh, and, you know, lawyers and prosecutors and judges are part of that public too. Hey, there might be another side to this story and don't rush to judgment. And clearly we've seen that in our past in other cases. Right, right. Uh, this is a good opportunity, I think, uh, for me to mention something I should have mentioned about your biography off the top of this podcast, is that uh, you point out that we both are, uh, I'm going to say former reporters and not old reporters, although both are true these days, but you're also an attorney as well. And so you right. bring that uh, JD and, and you know that legal approach and the legal stamp to this work which helps when you're working with somebody like a Letitia Quinones Hollins and the other clients with whom we work, because you understand it from their perspective. If nothing else, you know, not having uh, practiced uh, criminal law, I don't pretend to know what that's like, but I, I feel like I can at least uh, understand the culture in which they work and the constraints that lawyers face in both serving their clients, but then also uh, observing their ethical rules and conducting themselves, you know, as the best lawyer they can be. I appreciate you mentioning ethics, and that was not planned, ladies and gentlemen, but that's going to help me out on one of the later items that comes up in this podcast. But uh, not yet. Let's move on to number eight. Uh, number eight involves Cowboys owner Jerry Jones. Uh, he and the team made headlines uh, this year and end up in our 
top 10 for that, but not because of play on the field, but rather because of a paternity battle uh, between Jerry Jones and a young lady named Alexandra Davis, who says Jones is her father. Joshua Northam, partner at Shackelford Bowen McKinley and Norton LLP, shared his thoughts with us on that case. The uh, interesting thing about the DNA testing is regardless of your status, your wealth, you know, your position in life, uh, science doesn't lie. And DNA is DNA, whether you're, you know, rich or poor, famous or not. I think the legal question here really is, does that confidentiality agreement prevent this young lady from being able to find out if in fact he is her father through the use of a DNA test? And I just think as a matter of public policy, it would be really difficult for a court to find you know, that she's not able to do that uh, because of a contract that her mom entered into. In Texas, if you are, or if you're married at the time a child is born, there's a presumption that, uh, you know, that the person you're married to is the father. But when there's not a marriage, when there's not that legal relationship established, you have different layers of paternity, you know, alleged fathers, presumed fathers, um, you know, that are sort of legal terms of art. And, depending on that person's relationship to the child sort of depends on how you can pursue and, and track down uh, the paternity. And back then, I don't think we had the paternity registry even, you know, that makes that process a little easier. And so I, I think those are going to be the interesting questions is how, how, you know, contract sort of civil law, you know, inter, you know, intersects here with family law. And then, I think the timing of it as far as being able to get the paternity test and the DNA testing done uh, is going to be sort of the second layer of, of what the court's going to have to answer once she finally gets to hear it. The DNA test is certainly the way most courts uh, would resolve a question about paternity and whether or not a child you know, is the biological child of uh, an alleged father. I love Josh's statement that science doesn't lie and DNA is DNA. If you do family law, DNA has to uh, be a piece of evidence uh, unlike just about any other. It's pretty definite. You know, I think the thing that we have to uh, look out for in this case, and Mark, as a former reporter, I'm sure you'll recognize this, you know, the Dallas Cowboys and their owner uh, capture an, an an inordinate amount of scrutiny. And so on one hand, this case will probably not go away quietly. But on the other hand, I have seen uh, people in uh, positions of responsibility who, uh, you know, don't want to take the Cowboys on and they don't want to take, you know, Jerry Jones on. So uh, I agree with Josh, the public policy here, especially in light of the Me Too movement and what we've learned about how NDAs are weaponized. Uh, uh, this is a woman who was not a party to the non-disclosure. Um, I, I do see uh, the court uh, feeling that a DNA test is appropriate, but we'll just have to watch it carefully to see how it plays out. I would not be shocked if this case does not settle. Uh, given the parties involved. It's a fascinating question, this notion as to whether a woman who was a child at the time, almost an infant, uh, can be bound by this agreement that her mother signed. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it would be, you know, there's a thing in the law called unconscionable, and this uh, would seem to uh, delve into the territory of the unconscionable. Uh, an infant, one year old at the time, uh, cannot be held responsible for the terms of an agreement reached by her mother. Okay, let's move on to number seven, which is the border wars. As we all know, Title 42 was terminated in May of 2023, which prompted Texas Governor Greg Abbott to introduce the Texas Tactical Border Forces to address what he and others see as the escalating migrant crisis in Texas and across the United States. As the governor, uh, excuse me, after the governor launched Operation Lone Star, a slew of legal battles began, including the placement of buoys with razor wire in the Rio Grande. In September, a federal court issued a preliminary injunction against the state of Texas in response to a lawsuit filed by the Department of Justice 
mandating removal of the buoys. Governor Abbott appealed that decision, and the next day, a federal appellate court granted permission to keep the floating barrier in place until the Fifth Circuit ruled against the buoys and ordered their removal at the beginning of December. The legal battles continue as the state initiated a lawsuit against the Biden administration seeking to prevent federal agents from removing the razor wire. And Mike, I note, uh, I've recounted just a little bit of the back and forth and the back and forth on that. And then I picked up the paper this morning and the headline, Justice Department asked Supreme Court to let feds keep cutting Texas razor wire at the border. This one's not going away anytime soon. No, and this is a fundamental uh, question of uh, uh, state authority, uh, quite literally, the states versus the federal government. You know, throughout history, the Supreme Court has uh, reserved for the federal government all matters uh, regarding immigration. And uh, here, the, the state of Texas is putting up quite a fight legally uh, to uh, carve out some of that responsibility. Uh, it's got ramifications across the board. Like I would, I believe that uh, the strategy pursued by uh, Governor Abbott uh, is a, a direct result of the success that uh, uh, the far right uh, had in overturning abortion. Uh, in the old days, Governor Abbott used to, uh, when he was attorney general, used to brag about how many times he'd sue the federal government. Now he uh, he just uh, executes on arguably extremist policies and waits for the federal government to come sue him. And so uh, I, I think this is a fundamental issue. And, uh, you know, forgetting, setting aside the, uh, the emotional issues, looking at it just in terms of public policy and the law, if the state of Texas wins this, it's a... Uh, serious undermining of federal authority across the board. You mentioned this whole state versus federal authority, right? I, I mean, I did not go to law school, but I went to school and we we're all taught this in civics class and history and social studies. It goes back to Hamilton and Jefferson, right? And that fundamental debate about where does that authority lie that debate has gone on, as you point out, throughout the hundreds of years of the history of this country. Is it different at all in this moment and in this context than the, the battles we've historically seen between the states and the federal government? Yeah, I think so. I think that uh, there is uh, greater value uh, attached to uh, attacking institutions. Like looking at it from the state of Texas point of view, uh, you know, the governor has said, and many people agree with him, that the federal government has been inept at controlling immigration at the border. And uh, uh, a few years before he had passed away, Antonin Scalia, in a dissent, had said, "Hey, when the government can't hand, when the federal government cannot handle uh, something such as immigration, uh, you can't just leave the states defenseless." And so there has been a germ of an idea here that I think we've seen widespread in the attacks on uh, federal authority and on institutions. Uh, you know, I, 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 I do wonder uh, if this is ultimately going to be a situation where, you know, be careful what you ask for. Like, no one has clearly demonstrated that states have any better ability to uh, regulate uh, immigration coming into their individual states. Uh, the implications are widespread. Uh, are these uh, state officials who are uh, enforcing immigration trained? Do they know what to do? What's the impact on neighboring states? And what's the impact on neighboring countries? Uh, a nation needs to have a national policy. And if you follow this logically to its uh, uh, absurd conclusion, you could have 50 states with 50 different immigration policies. I just think that defies common sense, and I think that we're all worse for it. But this is a, a to answer your question, Mark, I think this is a transformative mo movement um, that uh, 
imp- it implicates not only immigration, but clearly abortion, uh, you know, book bans, the makeup of state boards, and, and we'll probably see more of this. All right. Well, let's move out of the political realm now and into the digital one. We can't talk about Texas legal stories without discussing the ransomware attacks that cost Dallas taxpayers in the city $8.6 million. And of course, there was another ransomware attack against uh, or cyber attack against Dallas County as well. And those brought in and involved the FBI and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Cybersecurity and data privacy attorney Sinan Pismichold from Bradley Arant Bolt Cummings, LLP, helped break this down. I think it's important to look into the levels of impacts here. Like when we have the theft of sensitive data, we have these cyber attacks often aimed to steal sensitive data. And, you know, we have these hackers accessing personal information of millions of people. So I think like, you know, when we look, talk about a city like Dallas County or Dallas City, we would see like a disruption of criti- critical infrastructure. Major urban centers like Dallas uh, present a particularly appealing target for cyber adversaries. These cities are more than just population centers. They are hubs of critical data and infrastructure. They store and manage vast amounts of personal and governmental data, making them treasure troves for criminal, for criminals and state-sponsored uh, hackers. Additionally, the interconnected nature of urban systems, from public utilities and transportation networks to financial services and emergency response systems, creates a web of potential vulnerabilities. A successful attack on one node can have a cascading effect, potentially crippling essential services and causing wide, uh, widespread disruption. The allure of attacking major cities also lies in the symbolic value. A successful breach not only yields substantial data, but also sends a powerful message about the vulnerabilities of a modern uh, urban living. The motives for targeting in uh, this data are diverse. For personal information, the goal might be to identify theft, a stepping stone to financial fraud or personal extortion, or in corporate sphere, it could be industrial espionage, stealing intellectual property to gain competitive advantage. And when it comes to government data, the aim can be, uh, range from disrupting governmental operations to influencing national security measures. Sinan brings up a very good point that I don't know that I thought of. There was all of the coverage about this ransomware attack. And I remember you and I have a colleague here who was unable to return books to the Dallas Public Library because all of those computer systems were shut down. They were hobbled by this attack. And when you extend that to something such as police and fire and rescue, this could become a huge problem. It was bad enough in Dallas that people had to deal with it, but there could be a life and death component to this kind of ransomware attack as well. Yeah, I think the uh, the problem is upon us. You know, we as a firm have been involved on behalf of clients in a couple of these, uh, you know, recovering from data breaches. And, uh, you know, what you learn is that the intruder is usually been in the system for a while, uh, undetected, and that uh, ultimately uh, there is a bit of a disconnect between the people who understand cybersecurity and the policymakers who uh, dispense with the funding to adequately protect computer systems around the country. I think with the uh, further evolution of uh, artificial intelligence, it will be even easier to crack the codes in a lot of sophisticated computer systems. And uh, I think uh, it's, a, it's a problem that is not going to go away and probably will get worse before it gets better. And it was interesting to me, and it is interesting looking back at it. You and I have worked with attorneys who do this sort of cybersecurity work on behalf of corporations. So here's training, here are policies and procedures that you as a corporation can and should, in many cases, are required by law to put in place so that you can avoid this. Until it happened in our backyard, I don't think I thought of a municipality 
as potentially a target? Municipalities, private corporations, universities. I, I don't think the, the, the Pentagon. Uh, I think we've seen in the, the spate of news stories over the past few years that no one can really avoid uh, being, uh, uh, being attacked or uh, invaded in this way. And, you know, maybe uh, the answer will be uh, the same artificial intelligence that allows you to build defenses that can uh, anticipate and uh, meet uh, intrusions head on. But for the time being, there's probably not enough money being spent, neither the private sector or in the public sector, to guard against these kind of intrusions. That concludes our walk through the first five items on our Andrevet Top 10 Legal Stories for 2023. To hear the next five, one through five, tune in to our next podcast. I'm your host, Mark Anik. We'll see you then.